All right, here we are just past Dragon's Mouth. And what we have here is a wall that a lot of water has flowed over in the past. It's like a waterfall of flowstone and stalactites as we come back and forth. A couple of columns have been connected here. Maybe this one's on its way to becoming a column, but it's kind of curving, right? It needs to behave itself better. If you grow straight up, you become a column quicker. All right, so if you all have a look at this, and in fact, there's a pool of water to show that this is not just what's happened in the past, it's, hap it's happening now. Water's coming over these surfaces. Some of them are glistening and look more active. Some of them are dry. The thing uh, I wanna direct your eye towards here and you can all shine your light on it, make it as bright as possible, is a color change. What are the two main colors that we see? Brown and white, or burnt orange and white, similar to what we saw before, right? Okay. Who wants to point out some relative age information that we might glean from this? Wow. Okay, so you guys, you guys are getting right to it, aren't you? Yeah. And so you could see sort of these waterfalls of white flowing over the brown country rock, right? These brown stalagmites grew up, but then the white is flowing around them, right? Wherever you look, it looks like the white is flowing over pre-existing brown. So I would agree with that assessment. How does that compare with what we saw at the other location? It's the same. It's the same. So now we've got, uh, where we've looked at it in two places, we've seen the same age relationship. And now that we've seen it more than once, maybe we're starting to think, maybe this is cave-wide. If we could find it, wave our arms a little bit and assume that maybe we find that it's a cave-wide phenomenon, maybe it's an even larger extent than just the cave. Maybe we go to other caves in the region and uh, see something similar. Is it a regional phenomenon? If it is, it might tell us something uh, really fundamental about change on the, regarding the soil input into this groundwater system in the cave. So go ahead and uh, speculate, cogitate, imagine what might be causing those changes in the influence of soil. It seems to be waxing or waning through time, the soil influence. Waning. waning through time. Well, some other studies we've done looking at sediments and fossils that fill up some sinkholes in caves like this, right? So the entrance, there were natural entrances to the cave that got plugged up. They're called bone sinks because they were sinkholes that got filled up with sediment. And in those sediment piles, you could actually see the fossils of a wide array of fauna of things that lived above the cave, things that lived in the cave. But mostly it's really a rich record of things that lived above the cave and otherwise didn't get preserved in the landscape above the cave, but it got preserved in these sediment piles as these sinkholes were filling up and then plugging up. They're found in, there's four main bone sinks, these filled up sinkholes in this cave, and they're found in those and right near those, but not far away from those. So a lot of these are fossils of creatures that lived on the surface and accidentally or intentionally went into the cave, but then intentionally didn't go very far from the entrance, what was an entrance at the time. Does that make sense? And so why would you, if you're a creature living on the surface, do you find yourself in a cave? Maybe you were ill and trying to just get away and have your quiet time. Maybe you were escaping predators. Maybe you were hunting. Maybe you were looking for something that was living in the cave. Maybe you came along and there was this hole on the surface and you know, you didn't have Google Maps or you were busy texting or something, you weren't watching where you're going and you just fell into the hole. So all of those things have been proposed um, to the way these, in terms of how these creatures got transported in. There's also a lot of smaller creatures, like small rodents, that l appear to be, have been brought in by raptorial birds like owls and whatnot. And they bring them in and the owls eat them in the cave and then they excrete them. And the owls, they don't go far into the cave. You know, they go into the opening just for some peace and quiet, but they don't go exploring into the cave. They just go in there for temporary shelter. Uh, so the fauna includes quite, a, quite an array of things, and we may talk about, time permitting at the end, we'll see this whole record as we brought up before, that there are jaguars and bears and, uh, and camels and horses and uh, these things called glyptodons, which were the cousin of the modern armadillo, but they're now extinct, the glyptodons, and they were the size of 
you can see, yeah, what a fishtail he's got going here. How wide are his arms? I can't get them wide enough. They were the size of Volkswagen beetles. They were a cousin of the armadillo. And they find their plates and their fossils, their armored plates and their fossils, preserved in these sediment sinks. So quite an array of fauna. But the one I want to concentrate on here that's pertinent to this is seemingly the lowly prairie dog. Like, why is a prairie dog so important? Well, these prairie dogs need about a meter or more thickness of soil in order to live in a, in a region. They don't live in this region anymore. The soil on the Edwards Plateau averages about 20 centimeters in thickness. Not much at all. For a, for a prairie dog to actually live and build its network, its gallery of burrows, right? They build their communities that way. They hide, they socialize, that they use this for all that. They need at least a meter, some people think maybe two meters. So think about that much thickness of soil on the plateau versus that much thickness, what we see today. How do we know it's changed? Well, in these sediment sequences, the prairie dogs exist from like, you know, the last glacial maximum, which is 18,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago. We see their abundant fossils and they're there, they're there, they're there, and then they disappear right around 5,000 years ago. So it looks like their disappearance, along with some other creatures that like a thick soil, are also not here anymore. It's not that the creatures went extinct like the glyptodon. Prairie dogs live elsewhere, just not here. They took up and took off and lived elsewhere, probably because the soil was no longer thick enough. So this was a, a model proposed by Toomey et al. He was a PhD student here, strictly based on paleontological grounds. And then we tested that using isotopes and as tracers, strontium isotopes as tracers. If anyone's interested, I'll be happy to share the publication with you. But we had a way to be able to tell by looking at modern soils, their thickness, Thick soils today have very high strontium isotope ratios, thin soils today very low, and we actually found those changes through time predicted by Toomey et al. in the strontium isotope measurements of these fossils, of these rodents, and also of the uh, aragonite seed coating on hackberry seeds uh, that got incorporated into this whole sequence. So we found independent confirmation uh, that was consistent with this hypothesis that about 20,000 years ago we had a meter thick soil and then by about 5,000 years ago we had lost that thickness to our present day 20 centimeters. So given all that information now, what would you do to test this hypothesis here? Assuming you had a permit to carefully and very conservation mindedly collect speleothem samples. Date them, strontium isotopes. Okay, so those are two bullet points in the project summary for an NSF proposal. Now read to me what the abstract of that NSF proposal reads. Or just give me, who, who wants to give me, let's, let's do this round robin. Someone give me the first sentence. We hereby propose to test a hypothesis that soils were once much thicker on the plateau and are influencing the geochemical composition of speleothems. We propose to do this by, take it away, whoever wants to give the next sentence. Okay, so maybe you'd sample some brown, some white. Okay, and then? We propose that the whiter layers began to form around the time when the soil decreased in thickness, consistent with the hypothesis. Awesome. And we propose to test that by the following measurements. Deadline. Well, we also propose to include uranium thorium dating of the stalagmites to, so we can actually have an exact date on their years so that when you could compare the strontium isotope ratios, we can time that to the soil thickness of the cave. Does everybody like that? Because then we wouldn't rely on just our casual armchair observation, right, so arm waving is one thing you do in geology, a little bit of data to make big sweeping conclusions. The other is armchair geology, right? We're sitting here off the side of the road in our air-conditioned vehicles and we're looking at the outcrop. This is analogous to that. We're just sitting here in our armchairs and we're not actually getting up and looking at the rocks. But from our armchair perspective, we think we have relative timing. But yeah, we could test it by measuring absolute ages, right? Uranium series isotopes would give us absolute ages. Okay. Well, I'm liking the way this is uh, shaping up. And now the next thing we need to finish off the proposal is the broader impacts. 
of what use would this be uh, for society, for the education and training of the future STEM professionals of tomorrow.